specter of what God is up to in Lombard Church of the Nazarene going to look like? Because I believe in you. I believe in what God wants to do through you. And I believe that your best days as a church are ahead of you. That God's fresh spirit is going to be poured out upon this place, and he's going to use you in mighty ways. And that's where we started five weeks ago. We started with this, with this word that said God's up to something, and you have a role to play. This God who is not okay with okay. This God who longs for so much more, right? We have that kind of God. This God who does immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. Then in the second week, we talked about how necessary the first step, the first step that we take as a church is we lean into God's future, into God's vision for our lives is to pray. The first most important act. To create a culture of prayer as a church in which we are consistently seeking to realign our lives to God's purpose and to God's will amongst us. And then the third week, we talked about what do you see? Recognizing that the differences that this church makes is going to be the result of us being able to see our communities differently. Being able to look into the brokenness and the hurt and the pain and the shatteredness and the despair of the people that we come across every single day. Whether it's at work or in the store or in our schools, we are surrounded by people who do not have the same story of hope that we do. And the difference that you make is going to be the result of what you see. And what you do as a result of what you see should be motivated by what we talked about last week. And that's this unbelievable message of hope. We have this good news that God has not abandoned the world, but that God is busy in the world seeking to restore, seeking to recover, seeking to reestablish his reign in the lives of those who have gone their own way. That that's what we are invited into. This week, I want to finish by looking at the importance of vision, but even more importantly than the importance of vision, what it is that holds our vision. What is the mortar that holds our vision together? So that's, that's the journey we're going to take today. So let's pray. Father, we, we trust that your spirit will be with us as your word is proclaimed. I pray that you would use me in spite of me, uh, in spite of my inabilities, inadequacies, deficiencies, that somehow, some way. The good news story of Jesus would be heard in this place. That somehow you would, you, would, you would give us passion and purpose and desire to serve you and you alone. And that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would move amongst your people with your word to accomplish your purposes. And at the end of the day, we can be certain that we'll give you and you alone glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. So throughout my, my 17 years of ministry, I found myself doing a lot of marriage and pre-marriage counseling. Um, my last ministry, I, in five years, I did 35 weddings. We had a lot of people getting married. <laughs> uh, so I was constantly doing marriage and premarital counseling. And, and I would find myself um, asking the same question of, of couples, regardless of if they were just starting out or if they were a little further down the road, and I would ask them this, this question. What do you envision your marriage looking like when you are 65 years old? What do you want your marriage to look like when you reach the age of 65? Now, I have found that, that we're not always good at answering that question because so often we fall in love, right? We jump into it and we just see where this thing's going to take us. I can't live like that. I don't do well without a sense of vision, of a preferred picture of the future. See, vision is a compelling force that seems to give our lives meaning moment by moment and step by step. Without vision, I feel like our lives are a bit aimless. They lack coherence. Life is lived willy-nilly. And I've, I've come to realize that when you live without vision for your life, it often paves the road for regret. You know why, right? Because you just jump into life, you do what comes next, and, 
and you just find yourself looking back years from now and you go, there was nothing that held my life together, nothing that made me feel as though my life had any sense of significance, nowhere that I was aiming towards, nowhere that I was leaning into that I knew that I had arrived at that destination and we find ourselves wrapped in all sorts of regret. Our lives last substance or consistency. Vision is about being headed somewhere. Now, there's a proverb that many people quote, and it's this proverb, Proverb 29, verse 18. It says, where there is no vision, people perish. Now, depending on what translation you read, it might say without revelation or without, without prophetic vision, but no matter what it reads, the, the concept is the same. If we can't see anything out in front of us, we don't live towards anything. We don't lean into anything and people perish. I, actually, I, I love what one of the versions says. It says this, that without vision, people run free and wild. And I think that's so true. When we lack coherent vision, people generally do what they want to do, right? When there isn't something guiding our lives, when there's not a guiding force or guiding picture, we usually busy ourselves about our own agendas. But as a family, as a, as a church, as a community, as an organization, if we can all see the same thing, if we can all head in the same direction, I, th I think it's huge. And, and I realize it doesn't just happen, right? If I have a vision for the way I want my marriage to look in 20 years from now, I realize that I have to start making the decisions right now to ensure that that vision becomes a reality, right? You, get, you can't just see a vision and then hope it lands you there. So I tell my wife, I'm going to embarrass her real quick. I have the same vision for what my, my marriage is going to look like when we're 65. I want to be the grandparents that totally gross our grandkids out because we're kissing each other and goosing each other in the kitchen when they're around. They're like, Grandma, Grandpa, stop it. I want that to be the picture of our marriage. Like, I want to be that in love when I'm 65. But here's the deal. I know that if we're going to get there at 65, i got to do the daily work every single day to make sure that that's a reality. Because if I don't do the daily work, if I try to goose her at 65, I'm going to be met with a cast iron skillet. So there's work that's got to be done, right? It's not just going to happen. And that's the way with vision. The vision, any vision of substance isn't realized in, in a day or a week or a month or even a year. It takes years. And it means starting small. It means laying block by block, doing diligent effort after taking diligent effort, doing the small thing after the small thing, seeming something bigger and beyond anything we can imagine take shape. Vision is a powerful force. It's a compelling force. It's a force that gives direction to our lives and grants us a picture that calls us to action. And I believe that vision is necessary for every aspect of our lives. What's your preferred picture of your family, of your marriage? Let me ask this question. And it's a question that I think is going to be really important for, for this church to ask as it moves into this next season. What's the compelling picture? What's the vision for how God is going to use Lombard Church of the Nazarene as you move forward into this new season? Now, here's, here's something that I want to make us aware of, okay? Because as compelling a force as vision is, our vision will always face certain threats. Have you ever noticed that? The moment that you start getting a preferred picture of the way you want your life to be or the way you want your marriage to be or the way you want your family to be or what, even what God wants the church to be, it will be met by threats. And if there is no mortar holding that vision together, if there's no rebar, no cement, if it's not anchored together, the vision will become unstable and the picture that's preferred will be left unrealized. So I can't give you your vision. And I'm not going to do that. I can't tell you what this next season's going to look like. I can't paint that picture for you. That's something that's going to happen as you do what we talked about in week two, as you pray together, as you lean in together, 
as you together with the new leader that God's going to bring, begin to envision what this next chapter is going to look like. But what I can do is talk to you about the mortar. I can't give you the vision, but I can tell you about the mortar. Because there is a mortar that holds together a vision and makes it secure and stable. And you know what the mortar is for the vision that God has for Lombard Church in the Nazarene? You know, what, you know what's going to hold this thing together? It's one simple word, community. Now, now let, me, let me tell you what I mean by this. Did you know that God has always opted to work through people together as they lock arms together? You know, now, I know in the Bible we're always enamored by the big names, right? The Abraham, the Moses, the, the David, the Solomon, the, the Isaiahs, the the Peters, we, we, we love the names, those heroes of faith, those exemplars of what faithfulness looks like. But have you ever noticed that God calls the individual to work within the context of the community? It's the community that God calls. Almost as if the God is saying consistently, what I'm at work doing in this world is larger than any one person can accomplish. We've got to lock arms. We've got to come together. When, when, when God calls Moses to lead his people out of, out of Egypt, he calls together a people. He says, you are my chosen people. You are my royal priesthood. You are my peculiar possession. And through you, I will bear witness to what my grace and love and mercy in this world will look like. You will together serve me. When, when Jesus steps onto the scene, what does he, what does he do? He doesn't just call one hero, one champion. He doesn't say, come on, Peter, just you and I. No one else. We got this. He calls a ragtag bunch of young folks who don't know what they're doing to change the world together. And there's something beautiful about the way that it's consistently multiplied. Multiplied so much so that when, when Jesus ascends to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes, it doesn't just come on a select group of people. It comes on a a move of God upon a whole group of 120 people that together lock arm, share a purpose, and move forward together. The moves of God have always happened amidst a community of people who stand together as one in unity. And personally, I think that's why the devil works so hard to disrupt community. Have you ever noticed that? About any time that we as the people of God start locking arm, leaning in, and start running hard for Jesus, the devil tries to slip in and mess everything up. It's almost like the devil realizes that if these people lock arms, stay united, and commit to a shared purpose, they, they, they'll shake hell. <laughs> but if I can get in there, weasel in, and mess things up, create havoc, disarray, confusion, distraction, man, I can mess up. I can mess up what God wants to do. Now, yeah, yes, the devil attacks individuals. Jesus says that, 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 the, that the devil seeks to, to sift so that people are scattered, but I think, I think the devil loves to attack community. This sense of shared purpose and unity as the people of God. Because if you can disrupt the community committed to a vision, you can destabilize that vision. The building pieces aren't held together. Eventually, it'll come crashing down. That, that's the threat that visions face. The threat of a group of people who come unraveled, who somehow lose focus, who fall apart, and come apart at the seams. And when the mortar of community gives way, the vision is left unrealized. Now, the stories we've been telling over the last several weeks, I think they have compelling visions. Stories of Ezra and Nehemiah and groups of people who had been ripped from their homeland, taken somewhere that they didn't want to be, and all of a sudden the move of God comes, and there's a sense of vision that begins to draw people together, and they jump head first into what God had called them into, and, and they begin to get this picture of building a wall outside of a city to, to be its defensive posture again. They get a vision of what it means to rebuild a temple. There's these beautiful, compelling visions of what God wants to do through this group of people as God begins to bring restoration and healing to a land. 
But the last thing I want to do is paint rose-colored glasses on this one. Because no sooner did they get this vision of what God wanted to do that all of a sudden they began to have to do a threat assessment. I think churches have to do that from time to time. When, God, when God's spirit begins to move and a fresh new breath of God is breathed on a people, they need to do a threat assessment. And we've got to understand that those threats come from internal and external. Now, I think the external threats, what we would call attacks that come from the outside, can really be boiled down into three words. Discouragement, disappointment, and distraction. I think those are the three primary ways that, that attacks from the outside, that threats from the outside, will seek to call into question what God will want to do through you. Let me give you some examples from the story. So Zerubbabel finds out from King Cyrus that he can go back and reestablish the temple. And he starts to rebuild, right? And no sooner does he get busy about the work of rebuilding that the next king comes along and says, stop it. You can't do it anymore. Now, if you have felt like I'm listening to God, I'm hearing God, I'm going back and doing what God has called me to, and then all of a sudden you're met by that kind of obstacle, that can be very disappointing, can it? And it wasn't just a stop it for like a moment or a minute or a week or two weeks. It's not like, it's not like just the codes inspector came by and said, hold up, we're going to have to take care of some business and you can start back up next week. No, this is like for years they had to stop the work that they were doing. And I have found that it's those moments when disappointment comes that it's really easy for a community of people who have been chasing after God to go, you know what, we gave it our best effort. You know, God, we, we did what you asked us to, and we, could, we can't control the outcomes. You know, we'll just chalk it up to a really good shot, really good try. But I have found that it's in those moments of disappointment that we've got to lock arms, we've got to continue to pray, we've got to lean in and say, God, we know what you called us to, and we know that not now doesn't mean never. We know that we have to continue to lean in faith into what you've called us to, to see the fruitfulness of your faithfulness amongst us. That's the way you have to battle against the kind of disappointments that come our way. Then there's, an, there's another story, this story of Nehemiah. That he, he rallies the troops. They start building this exterior wall. It's a phenomenal story. They build an entire wall around a city in 54 days. It's an amazing story. But again, as soon as they start building... Threats from the outside. Sanballat and Tobiah. These, these voices that keep threatening. You know what I think there are? Voices of distraction. And I think too often, that's what happens when the people of God get together. Little distracting voices that steal our focus and get us, get us worried about all sorts of things that we don't need to be concerned about or irritated or stirred up or constantly worried or frenzied by things. I think those distractions can settle in and become just enough to keep us from leaning in with our full focus and full purpose into what God has for us. So discouragement, distractions. And I think, I think if you're not careful, it's really easy for churches to live into discouragement. These folks, they're rebuilding temples and rebuilding walls. These weren't wealthy, influential people. These are peasants, shopkeepers, farmers. These are folks who had been told over and over again, you're not the power brokers in the world. What can you possibly do? And you hear enough times that you're a nobody, you start to believe that. Do you ever realize that? That's why I think God has always opted to use the nobodies to show everybody that he's the somebody that can use anybody. You ever notice that? God... God goes, you remember when you were in like middle school and everybody was picking people for the teams? Some of you are like, yeah, don't, that brings me flashbacks. Because some of us in here, we're always the last one to be picked, right? We're always the one that kind of like. And then somebody goes, yeah, we'll take Jeff. Thanks. Thanks. Did you know that's precisely where God starts when he starts calling and picking people? He goes to the traditionally last picked and says, that's who I want. Because I do my best work through those that the world has written off as 
having no influence or no, no hope of making a difference because it's through them that I will, I will make the greatest difference. And I really believe that. I think that helps us stay out of this, out of this discouragement. But those are the external threats. Discouragement, disappointment, distraction. But I think there's some internal threats. And I want to just walk through those internal threats really quickly. The first internal threat is the survival mentality. Churches fail to live out the dream of God because they move into survival mentality. I see this happen all the time with churches. How can we just keep the doors open? How can we just keep operating? How can we just, how can we just, how can we just? And they live out of a sense of fear. What's going to happen if we don't? And I will tell you, good, faithful decisions are never made in fear. Fear puts us in a reactive posture rather than a proactive posture. And I think we have to be careful. God, God establishes his church and nothing is going to come against it. We, not, we don't need to worry about our survival. We need to focus on what God wants us to do to thrive. And I really believe that. So survival mentality, that will be an internal threat. Another internal threat, statistics. Ugh. Numbers. Oh, I'm so tired of the church. We, we are trained to focus on our numbers, and often our numbers in comparison to someone else down the road. I get, so, I get tired of going to churches and speaking, and then looking at me going, I'm sorry so more, more people aren't here. Stop worrying about what you don't have. Start with what you do have. Start with what God has given you already. Because there are too many churches that are going to miss the good that God wants to do through them because they're going to wish that they had something that they don't instead of putting to full use what they really have. And I want to tell you right now, Jesus started with 12 and changed the world. Last time I counted, there's more 12, 12 of you than, I mean, I'm not good at math, but there's more than 12 of you here. And and God can use this group who are committed to him, no matter what statistics say, no matter what the big mega church down the road says, God can use this group to transform this community and the communities that you are located in. Number three, selfish agendas. Got to watch out for this one. God will start busy about something, and then we'll... We will turn our preferences into thus saith the Lord. We'll start to go, I, I want things like this. And we'll start to interpret that as God saying, so. no, sometimes preferences are just preferences. And sometimes selfish agendas can usurp what God wants to do. There's a great story, and if you haven't read Nehemiah, you've got to read it. Chapter 5, they're building this wall. Okay, God is doing a major thing as they're building the wall. And he's using a lot of peasants to do so. Well, the wealthy folks realized they could make some money on this. So they charged, started charging this exorbitant interest on the farms that these people had left in order to come help build this wall. And it's creating all sorts of chaos and confusion. And Nehemiah says, stop it. You've got to die to those selfish agendas so that the fullness of what God wants to do can be realized in your midst. The fourth thing that is going to cause a threat. And this is, this is a tough one for us as the church. Stances. Let me tell you what I mean by that. We live in such a divided culture. How many of you have been unfriended or defriended because of someone whom you've loved and cared about that you no longer share the same opinions about something with? Right? We live in that divided culture. And the church is a culprit in it. We've become so good at defining what we're against that we no longer talk about what we are for. Stances create trenches that divide us. We are not taking stances. We are committed to people with real stories. And the more space that you share with people who have stories, the more empathy that you can hear what they're dealing with so that you can respond in faithful love. We've got to stop worrying about our soapboxes. 
and instead pick up our basins and start washing those feet. So stances won't do that. And the last thing I want to tell you, and this one should be obvious, but sometimes you just got to acknowledge it, is sinfulness. Sinfulness is that, is that other internal threat. And that could be personal sinfulness or corporate sinfulness. Because let's be honest, I can't chase after God's purposes when I am distracted and divided in my loyalties and my passions. I've got to bring my full heart before God and consecrate it completely. Which leads me to the, so if community is the mortar, what's the rebar? So I, I, I've been to Panama, and I've been to Costa Rica, and I've been to Nairobi, Kenya, and I've done a lot of building. And in these, these countries that I've been to, when they build these structures, they use a ton of rebar. I mean, that's, that's, I, I have worn my hands to blisters tying rebar. If you've never tied rebar, it's not a fun thing, and you'll do it eight hours a day for seven that, that'll make you want to go on a short-term mission, won't it? <laughs> I'm a great salesperson for that. But I want to tell you, they know how to make buildings that last and stand. And I think there's some rebar that we've got to be able to put into our concrete to hold things together. And what is that rebar? A couple things here. Then I'm done. Then I'm going to go, and God's got it from here. First thing is this, shared purpose. Keep the big things the big things. We get in the church, especially in America, we get wrapped around the axle on a whole lot of things that don't matter at all. Jesus has commanded us, love God, love others. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the commandments that he has given. He tells us what the main things are. Share that purpose, that sense of unity around a common vision. I think that's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray as such. Let me see your will and your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's that shared purpose that we gather around something that holds us together, something that is worth giving our lives to. The next thing is live sold out lives. Give yourself completely to this Jesus journey. Can I just tell you this? We are lulled into lethargy by our complacency and comfort in the church. We gather, we sing our songs, we do our church stuff, we go home, and the world goes to hell in a handbasket around us. What God's looking for is sold out folks who are absolutely and utterly committed to the Jesus way in everything that they do. They haven't neatly divided up their lives. This is my private life and my public life. This is my spiritual life and my work life. No, there's a convergence of all of that. Everything I do, whether I go to the coffee shop, whether I go to work, whether I go to school, is all for the same purpose of bearing witness to the goodness and the grace of God in this world. Strength in prayer. I've said a lot about this, but I can't say it enough. Build a culture of prayer around here. It'll be prayer that will change the nature of what you do as the people of God and the impact that you make moving forward. Live spirit-filled lives. Stay in step with the Spirit. Can I encourage you to do that? I, I love when Paul says, stay in step. With That's like, that puts in my mind dancing. Now, I know, Nazarenes, we don't have a good history with dancing. Many of us probably don't need to be dancing as it is because we can't carry you. We can't keep beat. But I love when it says, stay in step with the Spirit, because I believe that the Spirit of God is dancing through this world, and we are called to live spirit-filled lives in which we climb up on the, on the feet of our Father and we allow him to carry us through this world. We live that kind of life. where Everything I do is in alignment with what God is up to in this world. And the fifth thing and the last thing that I'm going to say, please believe that you have a story worth telling. We have a story worth telling. This is the motivation. This is the reason why we do what we do. We've been, we've been entrusted with the greatest story this world has ever heard. And you have a story. I hear people say all the time, I can't possibly use by God. I don't have enough training. 
I don't have enough seminary education. I don't know enough Bible. You know, I tell them, you got a story? You got a story? You got a story worth telling. And I will tell you that it's often the stories that God has given us of his faithfulness, his provision, his protection, his redemption, his deliverance, that will make the far greater difference in someone's life than you knowing all of your theology or having read your entire Bible. Do those things, sure. But know that right now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got a story to tell. Tell that story whenever you're given an opportunity. Because it's the greatest story that's ever been told. That the God of the universe, who said, you bear my image, refused to watch us languish in our sinfulness, but who took upon our flesh, put, who took upon himself our sin and our punishment, who died to it, was, ro- was raised again, and sent forth his spirit so that we might live in his redemption and favor in this world. That's a great story to tell. And if this church is motivated by the good news gospel message of Jesus Christ, the best story ever told, this, this community will respond because they need to hear it. Can I pray for you as we, as we bring this to a close? Lord, I thoroughly believe the greatest days of Lombard Church in the Nazarene are still ahead. Lord, you know that I've been bragging on this group of people to some folks. I just get a sense, I just get a feeling, a stir that something's up. And I just believe that every season has a reason. And there's a, there's a reason for this new season that they're entering into. There is right now some lonely woman sitting in her home wondering if life is even worth living any longer, whose life is going to be changed because she's going to come into contact with some missionary from Lombard Church of the Nazarene, some missionary to their own community, missional agents, kingdom agents, Agents of hope dispatched and deployed all throughout this community and the community surrounding it. And people like her are going to find their way into this place to call home because they've been reached by your people. Lord, I don't know who it is that you're going to call here next, but I prepare that you prepare, I pray that you would prepare the ground for their arrival, the soil for the harvest, and that you would call these harvest workers to go out into those fields that you've spoken so much to us about. Lord, we celebrate the faithfulness of your spirit. We celebrate the hope of your future. And we celebrate the difference that you're going to make. And we ask all of this in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great week, and thank you for the privilege of sharing these five weeks with you. Blessings to you.